Welcome back to part two of the Mesa Boogie Mark I Repair. So um, we covered quite a lot in part one. So if you haven't seen part one yet, pause this, go back, open another window on YouTube and check out part one, then come back because it sort of continues on. And the sound clip at the end, I really hope it came through because it sounded bloody awesome here. All right, go grab yourself a coffee and I'll see you in a sec. There seems to be no sign of fading of that LED brightness. So I'm pretty confident that those two uh, coupling caps from the phase inverter to the power tubes are both leaking. Obviously we've got to do some pretty serious discharging. All right, we're making progress. And um, I'm just about to power it up and thought I'd better have a look at the power. And I'm thinking, I'm glad I looked at the power. I think it's wrong. Um, you probably know that that's the primary of a transformer. Um, and I can tell just by looking that the fuse and the switch are on opposite ends of that primary of the power transformer. What I can't tell and we're going to check now is, is the fuse on the live or is the switch on the live? Either way, it's the wrong way. So let's have a look and we'll correct it. So how are we going to test it? Well, I'll make sure this switch is off and I'm taking out the fuse so that we can now just measure here and here and see which is going where. But how do we check that? Well, we're going to look at our plug. And uh, I'm not sure what it is in uh, other parts of the world, but in Australia, active is on the left as you're looking at the wall plug. So as you're looking at the wall plug, left, that is your active. So if I plug one end of my lead to there, and then we just check with the other end of my continuity checker. We're listening for, for that sound. We'll see where the active and the neutral are going. All right, I'm clipped to the active. And we're now going to check to see is the white should be wide neutral. Let's have a check. And there's our black wire here, which is wrapped by this electrical tape held in place by the wire tie and then that goes off to the power switch so that should be active and it appears not here's our neutral the white wire okay he has indeed got them around the wrong way double check let's check our neutral side no connection there. Yep, they're the wrong way around. So what we've got is we've got this on the neutral, and this on the active. So now I have to rewire this and put the neutral straight to the transformer. We're going to go active to the fuse, fuse to the switch and switch to the transformer. All right, so this is where we will make those changes. I'm going to undo this connection that he's got here and that's going to go to the fuse. I've rewired the power. I changed the color coding on the plug to American color standards where black is active, but I put the black wire on the active side of the Australian plug. So um, everything should follow. The um, plug is wired wrongly. That's our active pin and we have the white lead connected to it. So I'm going to go by American color coding, which is the black is active. 
So I'm going to switch the, these two around and then we'll correctly continue the wiring on from here. So the black will go to the fuse and then to the switch. I've rewired the power. I changed the color coding on the plug to American color standards where black is active, but I put the black wire on the active side of the Australian plug. So um, everything should follow. So let's just have a look at what I did here. So here's our mains lead coming in. There's the black lead, which is now hot. It's now active. Just using yeah, one lug on that um, non-existent switch. Um, as a joining point, that goes to the fuse, the back end of the fuse. The fuse then goes to the mains switch here. The other side of that mains switch goes into the transformer, which is correct. Then we have our neutral, which is white. You can see I did a bit of a join here because we didn't have enough length. And um, that wire is now coming up here to the voltage selector, which then goes into the transformer. We also have this neon, which picks up its active from the switch. And there's another wire going here to the picking up the neutral air. So that should hopefully make that light work properly. Put in a half amp fuse. I'm going through my current limiter. I'm going through the variac. So um, I've just got three layers of protection just in case I've made a wiring error. Easy to do. Confident I've got it right, but let's just cover our bases. So here's our filament uh, winding, yeah, 6.3 filament. Comes to this little um, thing, can't think of a word. And then there's these big whacking resistors, these two in parallel, they're 33 ohm each in parallel. So two 15 ohm resistors going down to our filament supply on this little circuit board. The only reason I could see this energy wasting um, addition is that maybe our filament wiring here was just putting out too hot a voltage. I checked the voltage selector here and it is indeed selected to 240 volts. There's also a 230 200 and 117 selector. So if we were to change it to anything else, it would increase that problem. So whoever did this, uh, we'll, we'll check it just in case I'm talking at the top of my hat, but I'm pretty sure that that's what that's about, in which case there's really not much we can do about it. All right, oh, and um, I don't know if you saw that, but um, I replaced that little 22 mic. I found my, um, Delivery, I'll put them in the wrong place. So that's a hundred mic at a hundred volt. And it looks better because we've got three MOD uh, capacitors in a row there. So that just looks right. Okay, power switch on, standby switch on. 200 volts, I've got 400 on the B plus. I'm hearing a hum through my workshop speaker. The amp's nice and quiet. I'm liking this. While you were away, I cleaned each pin of the tube sockets. They had a fair bit of oxidation in them. So I chemically and mechanically worked on those. All right. So we're up to 240 volts. I've got 451 on the plates on the B plus. I'm very happy with that. I know the amp is now safe. Put that on AC volts. Should be 6.3, but it's 7.25. Now let's have a look at the other side of those dropping resistors. Yep, that's what he did. 
And um, look, I think that's it's very inefficient energy wise, but in terms of longevity of the tubes, I think he made the right call. Um, you can also see here, uh, these are the two new coupling caps for, to replace the leaking caps that we had uh, here. I used orange drops. Not that I'm a huge fan of orange drops, but I see them in lots of Mesa Boogies, so I'm going to go Mesa Boogie Orange. And yeah, so now the bias is nice and stable, that bias voltage. <clears throat> I suppose I should mention why it is so important that you have the fuse on the correct line going into a, any piece of equipment, let alone an amplifier. So I've just drawn this really simple little box. We've got active, and yeah, of course this is AC, so we're just going to pretend everything's going this way. So AC coming in, so active coming in. Here's our device, and it goes out the neutral line. And there's our incorrectly placed fuse there. So why is it incorrectly placed? Imagine if that blows and blows open. It stops the current going in there. Good, isn't it? That sounds good. Problem is, the active is still going into your device and potentially anything you touch in here is lethal. Sure, there's other protections, like if the chassis is properly earthed, then you're going to blow a mains fuse or the RCD, residual current detector. Either way, you're going to have active coming into your amplifier and being stopped at a certain point. Any of this is dangerous. That's why it is not legal in Australia, probably everywhere in the world, to have your neutral fused and your active switch. They have to be fuse first, then switch on the active line. Neutral goes straight to the transformer. That's that. The owner had given me a couple of second-hand tubes which were better matched than the pair that was in the amplifier. So um, I put them in and saw what the plate draw was and it came out to around about eight and a half watts per tube. Now 6L6 is 30 watts, 50% is 15 watts, this is less than 50%, which means almost definitely we're going to be seeing crossover distortion. So why is that an issue? The issue that I have with Mesa Boogie, one of them, is that they make this claim that their amps do not need to be biasing and biasing is just something that amp techs do to generate revenue for themselves. That is a load of bullshit. All tubes have to be biased. Wrong. All class A, B fixed bias tubes need to be biased. You don't need to bias cathode bias tubes once they're set up properly. Um, class A or, or cathode bias probably more correctly. Things like your preamp tubes don't need biasing. In a Vox type of circuit, they generally don't need biasing as well. If at all, maybe once to set it up correctly because many manufacturers just over bias them. They're running way too hot. Another story, another beef. So what I'm going to do now is I've got those replacement tubes in. I'm now going to start, um, I'm going to put a signal through there. I'll probably run 250 uh, millivolts, a hot strap, a quiet Les Paul. Uh, I'll run that through at about 440 uh, hertz. 440 hertz is, oh, come here guitar. 440 hertz is around about there. So a much more usable sound. Normally kilohertz, I think a kilohertz you're going to find up around there. We don't often play at the dusty end of the neck, so, you know, I do most of my checks at 440. Could probably even go lower. And I'm confident, I might be wrong, 
I'm confident we're going to see crossover distortion. Crossover distortion is not a pretty thing. I'll just explain what crossover distortion is if you don't know. So, come over, look over my shoulder. So here's what goes in. We're going to assume this is it's got a perfect sine wave coming in. And if we have a non-distorting, totally clean amplifier, it's going to come out much bigger, but still looking identical. Now, guitar players like the way tubes clip and saturate. So what happens is if it starts to saturate, that means it's trying to amplify further than the amp has got the ability to provide. So you're going to get a little bit of rounding off here. A little bit of rounding off there. If you amplify it a bit more, then the tube is going to start cutting off. It's going to start turning off, which means we're going to get into this non-linear region up here. And once again, we get a little bit of rounding off here. And you keep increasing that and you're going to end up, you might be able to predict that you're going to end up with something that looks like a square wave. That's not my taste, but hey, there's people who like it. So what is crossover? So that's clipping and um, turn off and uh, saturation. But what is crossover distortion, right? A, um, a Vox amp, the reason they chew up tubes so much but sound so nice is because both of those tubes are going flat out all the time. It's, um, the example I give is you've got two people one at each end of one of these saws and they're pushing and pulling the whole time. That's an, a class A cathode bias amp. Those guys are working hard. They're sweating. Psh, sooner or later, they're going to fall over. Tubes burn out. But it sounds great. So what do a lot of the Fenders, Marshalls, um, Mesa Boogie do? They've got uh, class, well, class B is when the two guys at the end of the saw, one guy says, look, I'm going to pull for one stroke, then I'm going to rest, and you take over and you pull. And that way, at least each guy gets half a stroke to have a bit of a break. So you don't get exhausted anywhere near as fast. So one guy is going to be going, oh, I'm tired, I'm going to have a rest. And then the other guy goes, I'll do it. Oh, whew, now I'm going to have a rest. And that's class B. Problem with class B, if you don't get this timing right where they hand over the workings of that saw, you take a serious risk of them both resting at the same time, and you get this effect. This is when they're both resting at the same time, and that sounds nasty. Nice, nasty, nice, nasty. So then we have, this is class B, that's class A. So how do we make sure this doesn't happen? We go to class AB. And that's when we go, all right, Bob, I'm going to pull for half the stroke. And then you're going to pull for half the stroke. But I'm just going to go a little bit longer. I'm just going to help you to get started on your stroke. And then when you're handing it over to me, give me a bit of a hand to take it back. That's class AB. And that's what most powerful amps over 30 watts tend to do, class AB. And that way, they're still getting that half cycle rest, but if you get this timing right, they're just gonna hand over a little bit to each other, and um, we don't get this nasty crossover distortion. Why am I saying all this? Because, um, Randall Smith, Mesa Boogie, 
have this claim that greedy Amtex um, say that you must bias your tubes, which you must do on class AB. Don't need to do it on class A or cathode bias, must do it on class A, of which most of the Mesa amps are. So I'm, and the only way that he can get away with, with saying this is if he intentionally biases his amps cold. Because if you happen to get a hot set in there and you've biased it correctly, then you're going to red plate those tubes or risk red plating them and you're going to reduce the life. So he intentionally must bias them cold to get away with that claim. Of course, I'm going to try it out. I'll probably be proven wrong and there's not going to be any crossover distortion, but I'm really thinking we're going to see it. All right, I have the amplifier on now. I've got master, uh, I might just bring the master down a bit. I've got master at five, volume one zero, volume two zero, and I'm going in the high gain number one input. So let's just, whoa. Okay, so it hits maximum volume pretty damn quick. So uh, with volume two on two, volume one on one, that's pretty much where full volume is. But what I want to draw your attention to is I don't know if you can see it. I mean, I can exaggerate it by driving it a bit harder, but that's not the point. The point is I want to be as objective as I can. I don't know if you can see, but there is a bit of crossover distortion happening here. Not as bad as I would have expected, I've got to say. And look, we're getting a bit of oscillation there, see that? So how am I going to get this bias a little bit hotter? Um, Mesa Boogie does not give us any uh, bias adjustment. So we have to look at the bias circuit and see what we can adjust to decrease the negative voltage on the control grid which will make it a bit warmer, so make it less negative. Okay. So I'm hoping you can see this. Um, where is it? Blue E. Blue E. Here's our bias circuit. Um, here's our tap for the bias goes into this 470 ohm resistor and a reverse biased diode to give us a negative voltage here. And here is our uh, bias cap that we've just replaced. You notice that the positive is going to ground and that's because on here we're going to have some negative voltage. Now to make this less negative we have to head towards zero. So what we're going to do is find this resistor here and we're going to make it smaller. So I'm going to use my um, uh, resistor selection box and I'm going to connect across there and I'm going to start I'm going to start with a very high resistance and then slowly decrease it until I see that crossover distortion there um, disappear. I'm not sure how clearly you're going to see this, but um, I'll do my best. So there's back onto six on the master volume. And there's the crossover distortion there and there. So that resistor there is 6.8K. So I've got my decade box clipped across it and um, I'm gonna, I've got it set really high, so effectively not doing anything, 990K. All right, I can see that. So I'm gonna just start taking it down 100K at a time. Still there. Okay, I've gotten rid of that 100K. I'm now onto my 90K. 70k and I think 
that crossover distortion is gone. All right, I'm going to call it there. So that's set to 40K. And I'm just going to tack a 40K resistor across that um, 6.8K. So on the decade box, we came up with 40K as being the start of eliminating that crossover distortion. So the nearest standard value is um, 39K, which I've just tacked across there. I've stood it out a bit so future tech can look at that and go, what, what the hell? And you can figure out that that is a bias modification. I've left the original one in there. I haven't replaced it so that it can go back to standard very easily, even just by snipping those out. So now let's check to see, oh, and here we come. Let's have a look. Did I do it enough? I think it's still going to be a fairly cool bias. But I don't know if you can see anything, but I can't make out any crossover distortion there. All right. Now I'm very curious to see what wattage our tubes are drawing. I bet you anything, it's still going to be very cold because we didn't make much of an adjustment. Tube B, 21.1. Now these were running at eight and eight and a half watts. We haven't adjusted it much, so I'd be surprised if we're over 10 watts. But let's have a look. 22, oops, 0.0227 by 470. Still very cold, as Mr. Boogie would like. I think these tubes will last a long time. I can even hold them. They're, they're sort of running so cool. Um, but I'm happy to go with that level because I'm seeing no crossover distortion. I'm going to call that properly biased. A common fault with um, Mesa Boogie and, and others where the signal passes through the send and return jack is unless these contacts are kept scrupulously clean, you're going to have contact and intermittent issues. So a little bit of isopropyl spray. Here I've got a jack in there, a plug in there, just to hold it open. And I reckon that'll do it. Doesn't need much. And now we'll do the same on the other contact. So let's have a quick recap on what we've done here. So I tested all the capacitors. Surprisingly, these ones were all okay. The one tucked on underneath there was also okay. These ones were showing sign of leakage, so I replaced them. I increased the capacitance from a 30 microfarad total to a 50 microfarad total by putting these two in series. Still, you could have gone higher on these and fenders, for example, do. They might use 220, 220. Um, the bias capacitor I changed. Um, that little resistor there is my bias adjustment uh, resistor. That's why I left him there for the next tech to see it clearly. That's the original resistor under there. I chose not to replace that because um, I wanted the next tech to see what I've done there. Importantly, the um, power wiring was dangerous. So um, I've now rewired the power plug, the bit that goes into the wall socket. It's now wired around the right way with the black wire being 
active as it should be in American wiring, because this is an, obviously an American cable. So, but from here on in, the black wire is treated active as it is. And I've got the active going to the fuse, fuse going to the switch, the switch going to the transformer. The neutral um, is going to the uh, voltage selector and from there to the transformer as well. Got a couple of other leads going to the indicator light. Then over here we had two leaking coupling capacitors, which is why our biasing was jumping up and down all over the place. Uh, replace those with um, MESA approved um, orange drop caps, which you see in a lot of their other amplifiers. This peculiar thing here I left, and uh, I agree with previous tech on what he did here. The, um, the filament winding was too hot, I think it was around about 7.3 volts. Um, his dropping resistors here dropped it to the, the correct 6.3 volts AC. Cleaned each of the tube socket pins on the preamp and the power amp tubes. Um, what else did we do? Oh yeah, we just just did the cleaning of the send return jack. So I think they call it power amp in and preamp out in this particular one. I think that's pretty much it here. Um, on the other side, um, I used the customer supplied second hand tubes that he had, which were closer matched to the tubes that were in here. And um, I think we're pretty good to go. The bias is done. Cleaned all the pots. I think we're good to go. I've ordered that new um, Switchcraft Type 13 connector. It's coming in from Mouser, either Singapore or Hong Kong or USA, and it'll be here in about a week. It's now about 10, 12 days later. The Switchcraft socket has arrived, Model 13. That's the make contact when you plug the lead in as opposed to break the contact as on the Model 12B. And problem solved, no more intermittent signal there. It's a beauty to behold. You know, I love the look of the outside of this amp. Not so keen on the inside, but I don't know where Messer's work started and finished and where God knows how many hands have been in this thing in the last 45 years. So I can't blame it all on Messer Boogie. I mean, the tracks are beautiful and thick, but just the layout is crazy. So I, I don't know who do, who's done what in this thing. So what I've been trying to do over the last few videos is demonstrate the amp in the sound that you've likely heard it in. And when you think of a Mesa Boogie Mark I, I mean, I could, only one comes to mind and that's Carlos Santana. Problem is, I'm not good enough to even sweep Carlos's nail clippings off the stage floor. But I'm gonna do my best. I've pulled out the PRS Santana model SE. I love it. It's got a much better neck on it than um, my American Custom 24. I took out the um, Korean PRS pickups. I'm put in Seymour Duncan Antiquities, which I really like. And so I'm gonna give it a go. Now this amp has got a reputation of having fender-like cleans which isn't surprising when you remember that it came from the Princeton. Randall's first job was modifying a Princeton. And, uh, and then it goes to growly, overdriven stuff. Not, not as crazy as it did later with the double and triple rectifiers, but still pretty dirty. So here's clean. Lovely. And here's overdriven. No pedals, by the way, it's just always, everything I demonstrate is just guitar straight into amp. I'm sure this can go way more overdriven, but this is one thing I'm not real keen on. Right now I've got volume one set to eight. I've got volume two set to not quite one about 0.75 on the volume knob. 
and the master is on one. So pretty much all the action occurs very low. So, um, which does give a great marketing impression, like you can have such volume. Check out my volume meter. 108 dB with these sort of volume settings. Fact of the matter is we're pretty close to full volume. After here, it's just more distortion. So um, I measured the output, about 50 watts, 52 watts, which is about all you're going to get out of two 6L6s. All right, here we go. That's it for this historic Mark I Mesa Boogie. I hope you got something out of that. If you did, please give me a like and subscribe if you haven't already. And um, any comments you make, I answer every comment. So that's pretty much it for this one. I look forward to seeing you at the next video.